Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast once again. Each week we bring you self-publishing tips, tools and resources for authors. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Bella. And I'm Trudy J. Welcome to the Spa. Hello. Hello. And this week we are very, very pleased to have with us Sky McKinnon. Hello, hey, Sky. Sky. Hi, Sky. Hi, Sky. Hello. Welcome. And she's coming to, to us all the way from Scotland. I love Scotland. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. With, yeah. It's a long way but to New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of almost the opposite side of the world. The world. <laughs> yeah, it is. Most. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Sky, I'm going to read your bio and then we're going to get into the topic at hand, which is talking about translations, particularly German and potentially French if we get time. Um, so, yes, let's get going. Um Sky McKinnon is a USA Today and international best-selling author whose books are filled with strong heroines who don't have to choose. <laughs> Yay! Um, she embraces her Scottishness with fantastical Scottish settings and a dash of mythology, no matter if she's writing about aliens and kilts, Celtic gods, cat shifters, or the streets of Edinburgh. When she's not typing away at her favourite cafe, Skye loves dried mango, as much exotic tea as she can squeeze into her cupboards, and being covered in pet hair by her demon cat, who we've already met tonight. And does not look like a demon cat at no. all. No, <laughs> it looks lovely. He looks like a good boy. <laughs> Welcome, Skye. Welcome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Now, one thing I want to talk about before you even start is you've got this awesome tagline, which is I saw in your um something like, uh, what is it? Tell me what it was. Ima- Imaginary Queen of Scotland. Is yes, that the one? That's yeah, it. I love yeah. that. You're the imaginary yeah, very queen cool. of Scotland. That's pretty good. My readers yeah, chose cool. that one. When I got my logo done, I did a survey in my little reader group on Facebook. Um, and I had all these serious taglines and proper yeah. ones, and of course yeah. they someone suggested it and it won and yeah. Yeah. I think it's, then I come back. it's so good. <laughs> I think it's genius. I think it's funny and it's memorable and you see it and you You never forget that. Yeah, Yeah. it's brilliant. Brilliant tagline. Anyway, sorry, back to the actual topic and um, podcast. So before we get into translations, can we talk a little bit how you got into writing and how you got into self-publishing in particular? We always love to hear the origin stories of our guests. Of course. Um, Actually, because I knew I was doing this today, I had a look yesterday at what my very, very first book was, and I completely forgot about it. I kept (laughs) telling people I started in 2013, but it was actually 2010 um, when I did a book. I'm not going to tell anyone the title because the cover, I was just yeah ashamed when I saw it yesterday. (laughs) I had no (laughs) clue what I was doing, Um, which I published in 2010. Um, But... And then I did some weird erotica under a different name in 2013 because I lost a bet at university um, (laughs) and wrote some caveman erotica um, because, yeah, I I keep doing bets and losing them. It seems to do how I do half my work. Um, (laughs) I'm not very good at winning them. (laughs) Um, But then, so I always wanted to become a writer, but people always told me you can't do that. You need to get a proper job. And so I became a journalist. Um, which is still writing, but you kind of can't make things up, uh, which you shouldn't. I didn't. (laughs) Um, And then in 2017, I was starting to, like, enter this indie author sphere on Facebook, um, and I was starting to meet all these authors, and I realized, oh, wow, they're just like me. Uh, Like, well, they're normal humans, Um, because in my mind, authors were still these... Yeah. gods like flying somewhere high up far out of reach and yeah. I met these people and realized they're just normal uh so maybe I have a chance to um if I do this properly and not just write a caveman erotica in a night and publish it and then forget about it so <laughs> um I published a book that I had been writing on for years kind of as a as a hobby and then met some author friends and started doing it properly in 2017 and it somehow took off um and I quit my job a year later and have been full-time ever since and yeah it's been a wild ride and I have tons of books and translations and audiobooks and various pen names and yeah it's been weird (laughs) that's awesome so So what, what genre did you start with Sky for your 2017 you 
it was paranormal reverse harem romance. Mm -hmm. um, I always write what, what I read. Um, yeah. So back then I had been reading RH for so reverse harem for, well, years, but there wasn't much out there. That was just no, I was just going to say that was be before the big wave. Yes, it was mm. perfect timing. But so I basically wrote what I was wanting to read, but couldn't because I'd read every single book out there. Back then it was easy because there would only be a few a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, very different from now where you have like hundreds a day. Um, and so, yeah, it just hit a chord and people liked what I was writing. And so it was, I was quite lucky in writing the right thing at the right time without like consciously doing any of the research I wish I had done um now when I talk to like new authors I always tell them don't be like me and actually do, <laughs> do a bit of research yeah. and do your preparation yeah. but luckily for me it worked out <laughs> yeah yeah that's awesome so how do you know how many books you've got out now like is it I can't tell you um according More to than... Kobo in total I have about 160 but that's across four pen names and with translations and box sets. Oh, yeah. So I think for Sky, it's about 70 odd like individual books, if you don't count box sets and all that. Okay. Um, but some of them are co written and yeah. So wow, yeah. that's pretty amazing. I usually say about 100 just in general. Yeah. yeah. You have been a busy lady in the six years, seven years. My goodness. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, yes. It's. Oh. Wow. That's very cool. Okay, so um, let's talk about, so uh, do you have translations mostly under the, the name Sky or are they across the different pen names? We'll just um, talk I don't have any of my erotica translated, I'm sorry <laughs> to say. Uh, <laughs> caveman readers have to read it in English. And, yeah. um, <laughs> Sky has most translations and they are the ones that I'm like really putting all the energy in. My other mm -hmm. pen name um, for kids has like, has them all translated but yeah the effort one is for sky um sky. where i have for my fourth series my translator actually just sent me the final book in the fourth series yesterday so i'm about to have four series wow. completed wow. In, awesome. yeah. so um so let's just start off what what made you when did you get start getting into translations and what made you decide to get into translations what we what was the reasoning so as you can might hear from my accent, I don't have a Scottish accent. Um, I live in Scotland. I feel Scottish. I have a Scottish passport, but I was born in Germany. And okay. Most of my family is still over there. Yeah. And so it was just a natural progression. Um, I wouldn't be able to actually write in German anymore because my grammar isn't good enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I have more of the kind of colloquial language rather than formal writing yeah. language now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just felt like the natural progression after I'd done print books and audio books um, and apps. It was like, what can I do next? Um, mm. That means I don't have to write as many new books anymore and mm. kind of diversify my existing backlist. Mm -hmm. And then I looked into translations and I found there weren't many resources out there. Uh, most people were just, it was trial and error. <laughs> and so I did a lot more research than I probably or basically I did what I wished I would have done for when I started writing mm -hmm. <laughs> so I really right. sat down and because I used to be a journalist I'm very good at doing research and like compiling information and making lists and diagrams and yeah. so I really went for it and then at some point I after I did the first few books um and people were asking me how did you do that and then I decided okay I could just actually write a book about this so that was my first non-fiction book then yeah. um as a guide but yeah the I started with translations in 2019 and the first one came out in 2020 for Sky oh, at least yeah um and so yeah that's been it's close to three years now I think it's going to be three years since the first book in about two months I think it was June or July so yeah wow okay what, what's the steps towards finding if you decide to do it what's the steps towards finding a translator so there's several ways. I mean, the easiest is definitely word of mouth. The problem with that one is that most people, once they find a good translator, will keep them close and secret and shame them up in their basement. Not that I'm telling anyone to shame up your translator in your basement. <laughs> that would be wrong. That would be wrong. I didn't say that. No. Um, 
but yeah, you will find authors who like have their translator. Um, it's like a good cover designer uh, or a good editor. Once you find someone, you kind of want to keep that relationship going. And because translations take such a long time, a translator won't be able to work for as many people as a cover designer, for example. So mm -hmm. something where they just don't have the capacity to work for 50 authors at once, uh, which is why they're so precious. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you don't find one by asking other authors who write a similar genre or even just looking at retailer listings where people might list the translator in the metadata, then the next step um, could be A, going to different translator databases. So for example, for German, um, there are associations of translators. So all the German translators who in Germany need to have, um, who are vetted and who need to register there. So, which means these are all like proper translators, not the people you might find of Fiverr, because of course you can go to Fiverr and find a really cheap translator, but most of the time that will be machine translation and you don't really yeah. know if you'll get the quality you want. And the problem yeah. is if you get a bad quality translation, it kind of sticks. I've talked to authors who had a bad one in the beginning and then it is very hard to convince readers to try again and like look at your book again if you republish it with a better translation. So it's better to get it right from the start. Yeah. Um, so translator associations are one because all their members are vetted, which makes it easy. However, they're often quite a bit more expensive because um, in the publishing and translation is still like growing in Germany. Mm. Their market is quite a few years behind um, what the English speaking market is. But it is getting easier and more and more translators that are aware of English speaking indie authors who are looking for translations. So a few years ago, it was quite different and none of them would have like contracts as a because big mm. publishers would, of course, provide them with contracts. Yeah. And so they didn't have to do any of that and they wouldn't have to do any marketing and any of that stuff. So it's it's changing. And then, of course, there are places um, like Upwork, and People Per Hour and um, there's Translator Base and Translator Cafe. There's li like lots of different uh, marketplaces, both specific for translations and just services in general. But again, there you really have to vet your translators because you don't know if they can do what they say they do. Mm. Um, so I always recommend asking in your existing reader ship um you will be surprised at how many germans you have already on your newsletter or in your facebook group um because a lot of them especially younger people do read in english too so you might find quite a few germans there who are willing to vet a translation for you in return for some paperback or some swag um it's always quite makes it quite easy if you don't speak in a word of the language yourself and can't actually tell if a translation is good or bad mm -hmm. Yeah. um it makes makes it quite easy to like just find a reader who already knows your style and your books and so that way yeah. you don't have to explain to them okay this book might be slightly steamy so beware <laughs> um yeah so yeah because you are flying blind aren't you? you you know you get your translation yeah. back and you're really clueless you know exactly and you, and you know that it needs to have a proofread or a read through and and you just like it's yeah you're scratching your head so you've really got to hope that you can find someone to do it mm. that exactly. is reputable yeah do you use yourself as a proofreader for your book? In my case, yes, I proofread it myself. Um, but I would always recommend if you don't speak German um, yes. to hire a proofreader. <laughs> um, yeah. It is just like when you write your book in English, you need an editor and a proofreader. Now, you don't necessarily need a, a developmental editor because that has already been done. So your German translation, it doesn't need that, but it definitely needs a proofreader, sometimes an editor too, depending on your translator's experience. Um, some translators will have a reciprocal um, arrangement with proofreaders or other tra translators where they do the translation, give it to their friend, they do the proofreading and they just give it back and forth. So sometimes it's included, which is mm. the easiest way. That's what I do. That's what I've got. And it's yeah. Like, yeah, it's very handy that way. Mm. Um, but if you do hire a separate proofreader, it can actually be a quite a good way to vet your translator as well. So if mm. you get several samples, for example, from three or four different translators before you decide, you can also give that to three or four different proofreaders, see what they come back with. 
if they all find the same things, then clearly <laughs> it wasn't the best yeah. translation. Mm. Although, I mean, every translation will have some errors. It's just like when you write a novel, there you, they will always be typos. I don't know mm. how often like you can go through a book and you will still find a typo. It's just mm. they hide. Yeah. They're evil. As soon as you publish it, um, you find a typo, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Years after, thousands yeah. of readers after, and there's still yeah. one. It's just yeah. incredible. And it's the same with any kind of translation. Um, so, yeah, don't fire your translator just because there's one typo. It's just <laughs> natural. Um, so with yeah, regards, can... Sorry, with regards to costing, uh, you know, do you pay ongoing royalties to some translators? What's the percentage of that? I mean, I've heard all different with regards mm -hmm. to payment types. Yeah. Now, a few years ago, um, most translators were, or at least German-based translators, were used to having both a flat fee based on the words or in their pay they have they calculated based on pages on standard pages norms item um they are getting more aware that most people in the english speaking world calculate in words and so they are more open now towards giving you rates in words but sometimes on translator websites you will still see it per page uh, um and yeah in the past they had it usually flat fee per word plus a percentage uh, um, of the uh, of the royalties. Now that's something that's kind of they are realizing that most indie authors aren't willing to do that. A because we're not used to giving away parts of our royalties. Plus it's just mm. a whole lot of admin, especially if it's mm. something like five percent. Mm. That just yeah. with all the currency exchange fees and bank fees, it's just yeah a lot of work. Um, so now more and more of them are willing to just do a normal per word fee, but if you don't have the cash, there are translators who are willing to do it as a royalty share agreement. Um, and there are tools to do that. For example, draft to digital has a royalty share thing where you can, when you upload the book, it does it automatically, which takes out a lot of the, the hassle and the, the work, although it has disadvantages too, but it's like, if you want really, really easy, there are ways around that. Um, it helps if you can say like your English books have sold so and so many copies and you've been a bestseller there and whatever and so it if you do any kind of royalty share agreement your translator will want to see why they should trust you to actually make the money back and that's natural I mean we all want to live yeah that's yeah. right yeah exactly <laughs> I heard and I don't know if this is still the case but do, do the translators um, own the copyright of the German mm. translation is that how that works yeah could you explain that to us yeah there's a lot of disinformation on that and a lot of fear mongering. So in the German law, the translator is seen as the author of the translation, which to be fair makes sense because it is a creative thing. It's not just a word by word thing. There is a lot of creative input from the translator. So they're seen as the author and they are the copyright of the translation. However, they do not have the usage rights and you need the usage rights to actually do anything with it. So if, in worst case scenario, you and your translator haven't set up a contract and they've just done the, tra uh, the translation, they have the copyright to it, but they wouldn't actually be able to do anything without a contract. They would not be able to publish it. So yes, they have the, <laughs> they own the copyright to it, but that doesn't help them. <laughs> that doesn't do anything for them. Mm -hmm. So, which is why you should always, 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 always have a contract, which then gives you as the author, the usage rights of the translation so that you can publish them mm. and the translator can't um so it's yes they have the copyright but that doesn't mean that they can publish it or that you can't publish it mm -hmm. so it is a very different situation and a lot of people are just seeing oh copyright they have the copyright so mm. it's awful and they can let us do their own thing and you know make all the money with my translation with my book but they yeah. can't okay. um so there's a very distinction between the copyright and the usage rights what they call the or exploitation rights depending mm. on your legal terminology it's the nutzungsrechte yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah always <laughs> had a contract <laughs> and, and if you needed a contract where would be the best place is there like a a standard contract that you could find somewhere or do you need to make get it made up by a lawyer how does that work um if the translator has experience with working with indie authors, most of the time they will have one that they can pro provide you. Um, 
if they provide it to you, always have it vetted. Um, if you're a member of like Ali or the Society of Authors or any of those author organizations, both of them do free contract vetting. And that's what I always do for my translation contracts. Mm. Um, just to, because I, I don't know anything about legalese. I mean, yeah, mm. I try to, but no. <laughs> um, yeah. um, otherwise, there are, um, if you go, I have a Facebook group. Um, sorry small mm. tiny little self promo i have a facebook group called marketing german indie book translations it's a great facebook and... group i highly recommend it yay thank you um, <laughs> and there's a sample contract in there now no guarantees that that sample contract is any good it is something that i used based on a contract from one of the german translator associations so I found that on their website and translated it into English because it was in German. And I had the Society of Authors, or was it Ali? It was one of them. Look over it. And uh, that's the one I use personally. Mm. Um, obviously, you have to change everything. And then the, and it's uh, it mentions British law, for example, because I'm in the UK. So, of course, mm. you can't just use it just as it is, because depending on where you are based, if you're in New Zealand, of course, you don't want to mention the UK in there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. That would be a whole minefield of legal <laughs> issues. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, most of the time you will find contracts. Um, what I don't recommend is using just the agreement that you get, for example, in Upwork or some mm -hmm. a place like that, because it doesn't mention things like the usage rights and the specific nitty gritty bits about German translations. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you should always have in your contract is a mention of any other rights of your translation, any other publishing, like audiobooks, print books, apps. Um, and it should be like in there in writing that you have the rights to tran uh, to use the translation for audiobooks for example and any other media that exists in the future because you never know what happens i mean we've been seeing that with the apps mm. popping up in the last few years and who knows what's next so mm. you want to be prepared for the future um and i i recently sold the the rights to some of my books to an a german audiobook publisher and the first thing they asked was can we see the contract to see mm. that you have the rights for mm publishing the audiobook translations yeah mm -hmm. very important to have that somewhere in there <laughs> yeah wow that's the kind of thing you can get tripped up on if you don't sort of think about it when you're mm. actually signing yeah yep. that's very good just and another quick question how long does it take a translator to actually translate an entire book like how many thousand words are your books and how long does that kind of take now, it depends a whole lot on if your translator is doing one book at a time and is working full time on it or if they're doing several at the same time. It's just like us authors. Some of us work on several books at the same time. Others do one after the other. Um, so my books are generally between the 40 and 60 K mark. Um, now, my translator doesn't work on them full time, so it can take depending on what she does. It's usually between a month and two. And that's kind of the standard. If someone gives you a translation of like over 50K in faster than a month um, and they're not working full time on just your translation, I would be kind of slightly skeptical because just like with writing, you can't do more than a certain amount of words a day without your brain just going into, yeah, you know, starting to smoke. And, yeah. Because it is a creative thing. It is not just translating manually one word to the other. A lot of the time there will be, they have to rephrase something or if there's like a joke or a pun or a play of words mm -hmm. they will have to come up with something and so there's a lot of creativity there and you just can't do creativity after a certain mm -hmm. amount of words yeah it's yeah, just human sure. so put it that way yeah yeah, yeah. so of course your translator can't do even if they manually could be sitting there typing yes for hours on end um at some point their brain will just stop working <laughs> and mm -hmm. so yeah um of course there are exceptions to the rule but usually between one and two months are kind of the standard that I hear from other people, especially if translators work for several authors at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a really valid point. I think you can't think of it like, are they just translating your work word yeah. for word? They're yeah. actually having to, like like different languages say things in around a different way and you have yeah. to actually yeah. translate it into how it, making sense in German. And even like the puns thing is actually a really good point. Yeah. Like yeah. jokes that work in England English work, don't yeah. work in yeah. German and you have to figure yeah. it out. So stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. And titles. Titles is another one because they've got that unique title rule, haven't they, over there? Yes. And they do. Your title can't titles are protected over there. 
Um, so you can't have the same book title as someone else. Um, so mm. you can't, I mean, sometimes, you, of course, nobody in English would call their book Harry Potter and something because there's all sorts of other yeah. trademark issues too. Yeah, yeah. But in German, you can't do that for any title unless you get official, you can get permission. For example, I got written permission from a publisher for one of my books, but that was easy because it was a children's book, the other one, and my was an urban fantasy with steamy romance. Yeah. So there was nobody was going to confuse the two books. And that's mm -hmm. the whole reason why that is. Mm -hmm. They want to make it clear for readers that readers don't get confused, which is, to be fair, quite a yeah. valid point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you, for example, see a title that is really the one you want, your favorite ever title, and someone is using that and it's not the same genre, most of the time, readers and uh, authors and publishers are quite open to giving you permission. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but you do have to ask for it and you have to have it in, in writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, otherwise always check, don't just translate your title from A to B. Um, always check if that title already exists. It helps to just ask your translator for several options, because yeah. of course you won't be able to know <laughs> what your title <laughs> would sound like or be work as, especially if you have things like puns in your titles. Mm -hmm. um, Get several options and do some research and not just on amazon but also research on talia for example which is the biggest book chain there look on apple books google books do a google search just tick all the boxes um because sometimes i mean you all know amazon search isn't always the best and sometimes it will only show on page five or six and you may not have scrolled that far mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah always go go the extra mile sure. just to be yeah. safe yeah. Um, because you don't want to ask your cover designer to redo your cover several times just because yeah. you didn't do your research. Yeah. yeah. Are there are there genres that work better in German for German readers? Do they prefer certain things? Um. Well, some things do better than others just because just the same as they do in English. Like sometimes, if you write, like for example, contemporary romance will do better than a super specific low heat Amish romance set in New Zealand mm -hmm. um so there are you know just like some genres are bigger than others that is mm -hmm. just same everywhere mm -hmm. and yeah. sometimes there will be um things that are something that is very specific to one country in your country might not work as well over there although sometimes it's the opposite way around mm -hmm. they might find it very exotic and therefore very uh, appealing mm -hmm. um I wasn't before I became an author. I wasn't aware of just how exotic Scottish Scotland is, for example, not just to German audience, but to anyone like any yeah. English speaking. Which is why I put the emphasis on using Scotland as part of my brand for, yeah. and all you know, the Americans love it. And yeah. um, so it's something that you are suddenly very exotic to, and you you are so exotic to me. I love New Zealand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we say that about um, where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's super um it's something to play with to um always make sure that to highlight that fact that you your books are for example based in new zealand mm. put that front right and center in your german blurbs and your covers too um but i think kind of most books if they sell in english they will also sell in german yeah. um there will be things where you have to be aware of like if you write about navy seals u.s navy seals um, by now, of course, most Germans will know what that is because of television and films, mm -hmm. but there might be some cultural things like or certain sports that just if you write about cricket, I'm not sure how many Germans know about cricket, for example, or <laughs> things like that. Yeah, so, true, true. Mm -hmm. How many books are there about cricket? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there could be an undiscovered things. niche. Yeah, everybody knows about rugby, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what about like wide versus uh, exclusive? I mean, is that a big thing over there? Would you would you go in KU? Wouldn't you? What What's your take on that? Okay, so small disclaimer: I am one of the admins of the Wide for the Win group, <laughs> and I'm one of the. I knew that. Um, but I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> directors of the wide for the win um business now we are now a company um oh, so wow. that said i am trying to be objective here <laughs> um, <laughs> there are pros and cons to both now if you want the really easy way ku is obviously the easiest because you only have the one platform to upload mm -hmm. however you will also have to do advertising um and you will have to spend money um now 
I am someone who doesn't like spending money on advertising. And I know you just had a podcast with Vanessa Vale. I'm very much like her. I don't spend mm-hmm. money. I am doing all the free things, which is why I'm wide with all my books, no matter whether it's a translation or an English book. And I don't do pay-per-click advertising. Um, and I don't want to because I hate spending money unless it's a book bump. <laughs> um, so... Um, plus the German market is very different from the English market. In ebooks, for example, um, Amazon only has about 40 to 50 percent of the market. Obviously, they're not giving us precise numbers, so this is an mm-hmm. estimate. But even at the kind of most conservative estimates, they have at most 50 percent of the ebook market, which means you are missing out on half of the market if you're in KU. Mm-hmm. The good thing with KU going back there is that they the, um, a lot of authors are getting bonuses there um, with KU, which seem to be easier to get because there's less competition. Um, but again, you're missing out on half the market. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> now, if you don't know anything about the German market and if you're not wide with the English books, you might not know. So I just tell you about Tolino. Mm-hmm. Tolino is an alliance of German bookstores. They did something really clever in, I think it was 2013, when they saw what Amazon was doing and how big of a threat Amazon was becoming to your standard brick and mortar stores. Lots of them got together and they formed an alliance. Um, and they share the same ebook ecosystem. They have the same ebook e reader. And which means they all only had to spend a fraction of the money to develop that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's now about 40% of the market, Tolino. So Tolino is not, you can, if you're already wide with your English books, you will see it in draft to digital that you can distribute to Tolino, but it's not one retailer. It's a group of retailers, um, including Talia and Veltbuild and eBook.de and there's a whole lot of big ones. Plus my favorite bit of that is that small independent bookshops can sign up to that system. So your tiny little bookshop around the corner can also sign up to that and can sell ebooks and through that make some money and um, you can support indie bookstores yes. as a reader and kind of as an author and yeah. I love indie bookstores yeah. so um, it's always a plus um, so that you get Tolino has about 2000 stores across Germany, Austria and Switzerland so that's quite a big thing and then yeah. plus the ebook side so it's about 40% of the market plus minus of the ebook market um can I ask a silly question just while yes. so if you are doing a German translation of your book do you do it and you want to get it onto Tolino do you do it through draft to digital is that how you would do it or do you go direct like how does that work I go direct um it is what I highly recommend because Tolino just like other wide retailers like Kobo or Barnes Noble and Apple they have promos and these promos are what really kickstarted my sales in particular. Their promos are amazing, um, especially because they have all these stores. So if you publish direct, and you can only get the promos if you publish direct, um, draft digital pop, puts your book on Tolino, but they don't have that agreement at the moment where they can get you into their promos. They might in the future, who knows? Mm. I have been nudging them uh, regularly. And if you want that, please nudge them too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But at the moment, the only way to get into those promos is if you are direct. Um, And because they have all those bookstores. So, for example, I will email them and tell them I just put up a new pre-order on Tolino. It goes live on that date. And then they will email back and say, oh, yes, we will put you in the newsletter for Talia. We'll put you on the Veltbuild website. We'll put you in the Carousel website. And we'll put you on the Instagram account of that website. It is amazing. So the first time I thought, okay, that has to be like ex- an exception because there was a list of six or seven different promos just for my new release. And that was my first one in German. And so yeah. Germans tell me, yes, I might have an audience in in English, but you're basically starting off as a complete newbie. Mm. You know what you're doing this time, but <laughs> for the audience, you're more or less new. Um, but actually they give you more promos the more often you do that. So in the beginning it was maybe five or six. Now sometimes it's 10 and wow. those promos are ridiculously amazing. So okay. uh, um, some of them really work. And plus once you've done that a few times and they know your name, they will then also start to email you and say like, for example, Hey, we've got this Easter promo coming up. Your book might be a good fit for it. Mm-hmm. Do you want to join? Because they don't have a dashboard, like for example, Coba, where you can apply to promos. It's all done 
in person, like by email. So I have a uh, question way, for a non-German yeah. speaker, though. Mm -hmm. Could we do it as non-German speakers or... Yes. We could. Yeah. Okay. I was just about to say that yeah. they love speaking English. Ah. They actually see it as a way to practice their English. Mm -hmm. So they like interacting with English speaking authors. And so you, you can do everything in English with them. The actual dashboard is in German. But if you use something like Google Chrome mm. or any browser that has like an inbuilt translation yeah. function, it works well enough to yes. help you with everything. Um, and their team is really nice. Any kind of technical issues, you can email them in English and they will email back in English. And um, they're very awesome. good at helping because sometimes at the moment you can also do print books there now. Um, and their print system is not the best, honestly. They are still, it's only been up for maybe a year. Mm -hmm. So you can see they're still working on things. It's still a bit of a beta. Um, I hope it's going to be easier, mm -hmm. but pretty much almost every time I have to change something about <laughs> the print books I upload. Mm -hmm. Um and they're very good at like explaining, okay, you didn't do that one right. This is what you have to do to fix it. So mm -hmm. it's not like the Amazon email sometimes that you get where it's like, yeah, something is wrong, but they don't actually tell you what it's wrong. Yeah. 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 Talking to wrong. real people. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Real people. Yeah. Yes. And... Just wrong. <laughs> yes. So who, who um, else can you go direct to? So there's Tolino. There's Tolino, uh, there's Amazon. Apple, there's Google, there's Amazon. You can technically go direct to Kobo. However, Kobo, their presence in the German market is tiny. And they even, they, can, they have a kind of special relationship with Tolino. And the Tolino e-readers are actually the same as the Kobo e-readers. Mm -hmm. They just have their different brand on it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Kobo doesn't really advertise in Germany because they know Tolino has that part of the market. Um, so I upload directly as a force of habit, but you can count the sales I've had there on yeah it's not it's not really worth it i should really mm -hmm. stop doing that um barnes noble you can ignore because barnes noble is us only so yeah um so i personally i upload to amazon apple google tolino directly and kobo and then draft a digital for any of the stragglers um there are some other ger german distributors that get you into smaller places but i've not really found them worth it i cover them in my book just kind of completionism and mm -hmm. i did look into all of them but yeah i wouldn't really if you don't have a lot of time which to be fair as an indie author most of us don't mm -hmm. um i just ignore them now tolino i should say has um since fairly recently they also work as a distributor to google apple and all the other places so if you are very short on time you could just upload your book oh. to tolino and use them to get into all the different places. However, their royalties mm. are the best for that. So actually, Draft Digital gives you higher royalties for Apple, um, Barnes & Noble, Kerbo, and all those places. But sometimes time is worth more than, than money. Mm -hmm. So if you are stretched with time, you could just use Tolino and upload directly to Amazon to have access to ads and all that, of course. And you don't want to give away part of your Amazon royalties because that is still the biggest or the second biggest market, depending on who's higher mm -hmm. um but yeah that's the ones for print books and print books are still a lot bigger there um even for the steamy romance that i write <laughs> um i sell a lot more print books in germany or for my german translations than i do for my english books um ingram spark is an option but it's not the best option because in germany there are three databases that highlight all the books that are available. It's like a database where the booksellers go to mm -hmm. to see what, what books are out there. Ingram Spark only gets you into one of them. And unfortunately, it's not the one that most of the bookstores use. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I did in the beginning until Tolino started offering print books. And Tolino gets you into all three of them, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you're in KU with your German eBooks, I would recommend going direct for your print books with Tolino because that's separately. You can be wide with your print books, mm. even if you're in KU with your ebooks. Um, and if you want to me to brag a little, um, <laughs> Tolino is now starting to advertise or to market print books in their stores. And in January, one of my books was their indie book of the month. And they oh, had me nice. like in most of their Talia retail stores in Germany. Oh, nice. And there were like wow. hundreds of those stores. I'm still waiting for the sales report to be honest. I don't know how much it was, but I had German readers. I did it as a kind of challenge of find my books mm -hmm. and take a picture. And then I will send you a signed bookmark as a reward. So I got all those pretty pictures of my book 
on mm. their tables. Wow. It was amazing. Um, if I wasn't, I was moving a house back then. Otherwise, I would have booked a, pl- uh, a flight to Germany yes. to actually see in person <laughs> and take some selfies. Um, but yeah, and they're doing that. They're planning to do or like offer promotions for us authors in their retail stores. And that's going to be groundbreaking because mm. I don't know any English speaking retail store mm. that actually offers that to us no. to get into those brick and mortar stores. So yeah, I was that featured author, which, which meant because they ordered their books still in 2022, that I was number 13 in their Tolino bestseller list for print books. Wow. The, like, for Apply 2022, which wow. was just ridiculous wow. because it was a new book. So it wasn't even like an existing series. It was the first book in a new series. Wow. Um, so which one was it? Been, Sky, which one was it? It was Tortellus Winters, which is my winter princess. Oh, um, wow. It was my very first series that I published in English um, and uh-huh. my fourth series in German. Um, so, yeah, it was very cool. Crazy. So if you're going into print, your ebook file that you got translated, do you need to get a little bit more work done that before you go into print, or is it just fine to put that into print? You know, like, you know what I mean? If you, yeah, if yeah. You um, where I'm coming from. There's a few things you have to do, which is also something you have to do for ebooks. Uh, the impresso, which is your copyright page, which is something you're legally obliged to have in your books as soon as they are for an uh, for a German speaking audience. Mm-hmm. Um, it is your copyright page, which basically has like this book was written by, and it also needs to have your address. It needs to have um, a way where people can contact you in legal matters which is an annoying thing because most of the time that means you have to have your address. But if you have a business address or an agent's address, that can also work. Um, It's a kind of a bit of a minefield. There are some like gray zone offers where people have services so that you can put their address Mm -hmm. in there instead of your own one, because none of us like putting our personal address into our books. Mm. Um, But that's, for example, why I put my impressum at the end of my ebook so that it doesn't show up in the sample. Mm. But in print books, for Tolino, for example, you need to have it on your, wait, that is page one, it's page two. So it's the first spread mm-hmm. that you have on the left. So for, if you upload to Tolino, it needs to be on that page. It needs to have Impressum as a title above it. Um, so there's some like formatting issues in that way. There's also one weird little thing that you might not be aware of, uh, quotation marks. Are different in German than they are in English. In English, we have them both at the top and two little mm-hmm. dashes. Mm-hmm. I guess if you describe them, it was they, what they look like, um, or one dash. <laughs> the kind of American versus British system. Um, in German, there's two ways of doing it. There's either the what they call Gänsefüßchen, uh, goose feet, mm-hmm. um, which are the little dashes, which is something that most people use only in, um, like. Uh, informal writing mm. so in german you will a lot of the time you'll see little triangles um which is the german way now honestly nowadays it's not a huge thing if you use one versus the other um so if your translator gives you your manuscript with having the just the dashes very few german readers will complain about that however there are some who are very old school and who will say having the triangles looks more professional because that's what the big publishers the trad publishers are doing Mm. and that's what you kind of see in most books if you go to a bookstore Mm. so there's small things like that um but in general your translator will kind of should have a grasp on that and should Mm. tell give you your translation in a way that you can just throw it into vellum or whatever atticus or whatever program you're using Mm -hmm. um trim sizes now you know how in english you usually have six by nine or five Mm -hmm. by eight for fiction in German it is the wild west there is no (laughs) size when I was writing my book about German translations I had my sister who lives in Germany go to a bookstore and go to fantasy romance and measure 10 books in a random random books I think it was eight different sizes that she found out of 10 books oh wow so it doesn't basically matter (laughs) your book there will always be a book that will be your size and there will be lots of books that aren't your size so german bookshelves you know on instagram they always have these shelfies and these Mm -hmm. really pretty books the german ones don't look as pretty as the english ones (laughs) because they're not as regular (laughs) um 
But I would go by what, if you, for example, publish via Tolino, I would go by what size Tolino supports, which is what I do. And two of those sizes are in vellum. So that is what I do. I use one of the sizes that is in vellum because I format in vellum. So if you format, for example, in Atticus or some other, I would check, do any of those sizes match what Tolino accepts and go by that. Yeah. Um, but technically, you could have your book square and <laughs> probably, yeah, it wouldn't look wrong on the bookshelf. <laughs> so, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> Well, very it, strange I, I don't know why because usually you always say Germans like rules and I was yeah. going to say that is yeah. very un-German to me as a complete I think, outsider I think Germans are secret rule breakers like on the surface oh, they yes. like the rules and then underneath they just like to break them um deep inside <laughs> yeah deep inside so what about covers do you keep your cover the same and just put the new title on it or, or are there different covers that work or different styles that work in Germany it depends on the genre. Um, definitely to do your research. Uh, I see a lot of authors who don't do that and who just use the same cover thinking mm -hmm. that it will work. Um, to be fair, it's changed a bit over the years. A few years ago, for example, in romance, you wouldn't find a lot of Manchester on mm -hmm. German covers. You'd find a lot of object covers or stylized covers, the drawn couple. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times on German covers, you will see where the book is set no matter the genre, a lot of the times you will have like a beach in the background or a rolling hills of Ireland or the Scottish Highlands or beautiful New Zealand landscapes. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is something that has per persisted. Um, so it depends a bit. If you look at what's trending right now on Amazon, a lot of the times it will be the exact covers because Amazon um bestseller lists are fickle they change all the time and mm -hmm. a lot of that is driven by people who spend a lot of money in ads um and who didn't always do their research so for cover research i would recommend going to the wide platforms because that's where you find authors who usually have done the research because they might not if you don't you will just throw it in ku and that's the easiest way if you do your research and you might see that tolino has such a big share you might put it there and you will see that the covers are slightly different mm -hmm. um Manchester can sell. I have Manchester on some of my covers, but it is often done slightly more tastefully mm. <laughs> than yeah. in English. Um, and then for other genres, it is completely different again. So it definitely do your research. Mm. Some of them you will be lucky and mm. you can do exactly the same. Sometimes they will be vastly different and it's really worth getting new covers. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes I've just changed the colors, the color scheme, because mm -hmm. I thought, okay, this works. But for example, urban fantasy in English, a lot of it is like blues, mm -hmm. purples. Um, well, they are found a lot of books with like more um, greens. And mm -hmm. so I changed my color scheme slightly and kept the co cover mostly the same. Um, and that works. So mm -hmm. if your books are not selling in German, the cover is often one of the first things I'd look at. Yeah. Um, plus other things like blurbs. Blurbs are usually smaller, shorter, mm -hmm. and more concise in German. Um, so that is something, again, look at blurbs, look at what people are doing. Even if you don't understand their blurbs, you can see the size. Yes. Um, and you can see that in your genre in English, you might do these really long blurbs, or you might do one paragraph. If it's, if it's a romance, you might do one paragraph mm -hmm. per, per part, partner in the couple. It might be different in German. So you do want to look at the conventions there because yeah. you can't always just translate your German blurb, uh, your English blurb into German and think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there are all those bits and pieces. So just do your research. you don't research. always think about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do your research, basically. Have a look. Um, and I, I'm assuming there's similar thing for the pricing, right? Like you just need to see what other books in your genre are priced at and go with that yes is, yeah you could generally go higher which is nice um and you don't really need to worry about what your english book is priced in german because a lot of i mean if you for example if you imagine you as an english-speaking author are looking at a book that has been translated from french or german who of us actually goes and checks what exactly. price the original is yeah. nobody yeah. No. so don't be worried to go up a euro or two for your German book, depending on the genre. Do look what people are doing. But in general, my rule of thumb is at least a euro more expensive than the English original. Yeah. Okay. Um box sets. I found German readers love box sets. And again, you can price them 
higher or put less books into a box set and to keep to that 999 ceiling that Amazon has mm. to get the 70%. Um, yeah, pricing generally go high. Now, permafreeze is not something that is very common in Germany yet. It is becoming more popular because English speaking authors mm. are introducing it, just like a lot of trends. We are bringing a lot of trends over there, yeah. like Manchester covers and permafreeze. At the moment, I have one promo free, um, which I did more or less as an experiment in the beginning. 99 cent sales are something I always do first. I do a yes. few 99 cent sales. Whenever I release a new book, for example, in a series, I might put book one up for 99 cents mm -hmm. for a week or two. And those work really well. They work better than 99 cent sales do in English, unless, of course, you get a book bub. But book bub always <laughs> makes things different. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, 99 cent sales can work really well, especially if you get things like an Apple or a Tolino promo um, on that. Mm -hmm. Freebies can work as well, but be prepared to get a lot of reviews saying like, I was expecting this book to be rubbish because it was free. Mm -hmm. um, wow. They associate <laughs> free yeah. with bad quality. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at my Amazon reviews of my perma free book, a lot of them mention the quality, like how surprised they are at how good it is, which to be fair is a nice review. Like it's not yeah, a yeah. bad one, but it's, I was not prepared for that <laughs> when I <laughs> first made that book free because yeah. in, that's not something that happens a lot in English. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in English, people might say, I stumbled across this because it was free and I was pleasantly yeah. surprised or yeah. I really, yeah, got it's hooked and read the rest. But in Germany, you will get a lot of, this book is good, even though it's free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, it was yeah. something you have to get used to. What about yes. International Book Bub? Do you apply for that specifically to to get the German readership? No, because at the moment, uh, Book Bub doesn't send to German readers or to readers in Germany. Ah. They only to US, UK, German, uh, Canada and Australia. So they don't do Germany. Gotcha. Um, and I've been trying to ask them, could mm. you do that? But it would be, they say it's just too much hassle, mm. basically. Um, hard. So I doubt if they'll ever do it. There is a kind of book pub equivalent in a very small way, uh, which is called Buch Deals, uh, B U C H D E A L S, um, which is a deal site in German. It is a lot smaller. Um, mm. The good thing is, that they take everyone you don't have to apply and be rejected um it is also a lot cheaper you don't get the same reach but it's still i find it worth it for most books there have been a few books that just about broke even but most of my books where i had like a 99 cent sale or freebie i at least made a small profit so i continue doing that because even especially if you're new to mm. the market it's a good way to get that exposure. Um, so even if you don't make a profit, at least you get those readers that you can then hopefully yeah. hook yeah. and keep on as your first fans. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have a new release feature as well, which I like personally. It's always hard to know if a new release email, how much it does, because you don't know for a new release where the mm -hmm. sales are coming from. However, I do feel like it makes a difference. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have um, an email newsletter? In I do. Okay. I do. I don't use it as much as I would like. In an ideal world, I would send it more often. Right now, I mostly send it for new releases. Um, I would s recommend setting one up, even if you don't intend to use it, because you do, or like, use it right away, because you want to capture those email addresses from the start, um, even if you, yeah. So the easiest way to do it is to ask your translator for, I'd like to call it building blocks, mm -hmm. things like, hello, dear reader, I have a new release. How are you? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a few sentences that you can then mix and match. And for example, I have a new release. Here's the blurb. Then you can copy and paste the blurb that you already have. Mm -hmm. Then you can put in happy reading or here's the link. So if you have a few of those building blocks, you can mix mm -hmm. and match them. And you don't have to ask your translator each time. Could you please translate my newsletter? And you don't mm -hmm. have to pay for that. <laughs> so you can have those bits and pieces of that course you can also use things like mm -hmm. it, oh it does um and that's what i do for french for example at the moment because my french is well rusty at best so i ask my french translator to give me those building blocks mm -hmm. and that way i send a newsletter every time i have a release and it doesn't feel like 
I'm ignoring my newsletter, even though <laughs> in in an ideal world, yeah. I would send my newsletter, the newsletter that I write in English, immediately to my German and my French translator, and then yes. also send it off. But it's not an ideal world. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you send, uh, how often do you have new releases? How often does that go out? Um, I try to have them very in a regular interval. So at the moment, it's about every two months. Mm. In the beginning, I had them more often because I had my translator do a few of them and I just kept them back until I had three or four of them ready and then I released them every few weeks. Mm. Um, if you are in KU, the same rules apply basically for rapid release works and Amazon has cliffs and mm. same thing as you already used to, so it helps to release fast. If you wide, those cliffs don't matter as much because a bigger chunk of your income is coming from outside of Amazon. Mm. So I've experimented with everything between three weeks and two months and I've not really seen a difference mm. um it is better to be consistent than to be rapid releasing and then have huge gaps in between mm -hmm. yeah one thing I highly 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 recommend in the beginning is to have when you publish your first book even if you put up a pre-order to also put up pre-orders for books two and three if you have a series mm. because readers have been burned so often not mm. just by indies also by trad publishers who also pub only publish the first book in a series and then stop yeah. And that's just evil, especially if you end on a cliffhanger. There mm. are so many series where readers will have got invested and then they will never find out what happened after that character died. Mm. So it is just from a reader perspective, you will want to show them that you're in there for the long haul. Mm. Um, it can help if you're not quite sure what to start with, to start with a trilogy or like a shorter series or a series mm. where, you can, where you can stop in the middle somewhere if it doesn't work out. So that's why I started with a seven book series that is, it's a continuous story, but it has two story arches that, and the one of them ends after book four. Mm -hmm. So I could have stopped after book four without readers feeling like they're missing something. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, all the other ones have cliffhangers or hooks, but book four ends on a kind of happy for now that I would have rewritten slightly to be a completely happy end. And mm -hmm. that was my plan. If it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. they have four books, but yeah, I don't need to do seven books just to keep the yeah. readers happy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you're just dipping your toes in, I wouldn't do a standalone just because standalones are harder to promote, just like they are in English. Um, mm -hmm. Series are always easier, but do something like a shorter series or a series of standalones where you can just stop at some point, mm -hmm. but always have a pre-order up to show people, even if it's a pre-order for a year in advance and you can pull it forwards mm -hmm. depending on your translator's availability. It's just to show them something is coming because readers have been burned. Yeah, yeah, I'm not asking true. for um, your own personal information, but if somebody's interested in doing German translation, say it's a romance, forty-five to fifty thousand words, what range would they be looking at to pay for a German translation? Like, what's a ballpark range? Um, now, when I wrote my book about translations, I did like a little survey with authors, mm -hmm. and the standard seems to be between about five to eight cents per word mm -hmm. and that's euro cents um, yeah. as a kind of standard you can go lower you can go a lot higher mm -hmm. that was kind of the average that i found amongst authors now if you ask professional translators they will be more between like literary translators that's an important distinction there there are translators who translate things like documents and mm -hmm. non-fiction which is very different from a literary translator who knows about the creative aspect. Mm -hmm. um, they will usually be, be in between the 8 to 12 cents, right. euro cents per yeah. word mark. So any translation will usually be in the thousands. Mm. It also depends on whether proofreading will be included or not. Um, of if you add proofreading, that will be another mm -hmm. one to three cents a word. Um, so, yeah, it's not a cheap thing. No. <laughs> definitely not sometimes I would go over quality over price mm -hmm. um just because I have heard so many horror stories since I because I wrote that book and I do one-on-one -on -one consultations with people and so I have like yeah. heard so many awful stories and sometimes it's better to invest one cent per word more and have yes. a good translation than to have to redo it all and spend a lot more money and time absolutely on having to start again and yeah. not just starting again with your translation but also your reputation and that's the worst thing I mean 
Mm. Yeah, of course. And yeah. can you just give a shout out to the title of your book? I know it's on your um, back of your, for those of us that are watching on YouTube, we can see it on your oh, wall, oh, but if you could just read it out to us. It's just called self-publishing in German. I write it as Sky B. McKinnon. <laughs> I just added a added random initial just to separate it from my fiction. Great book. I, I I've got it. It's a great book. Yay. Mm. Um, by the time this podcast goes live, there should be the second edition of it. And there's only a few new ad edits like the print books, because, of course, I asked Alina, is there going to be anything new coming out soon when I publish this book? And they were like, no, it will be a few months. I published it. And the week after they announced print. <laughs> oh my God. So. But then isn't that exciting, though, that there's actually developments in the market for mm -hmm. authors all the access. Time. So it's, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. There's mm -hmm. new stuff all the time. Um, so I really like I realized fairly quickly that a book like that will never be completely up to date which is why I have that Facebook group yeah. where if there's anything new I always post it there mm -hmm. um and then of course I have some consultation clients who like come back again and again and just basically ask what's new <laughs> what shall we talk yeah. about now what can yeah. I improve and so yeah. there are ways like just keep up to date even if yeah. you don't speak German and don't want to subscribe to all the different newsletters however mm -hmm. by the way I do highly recommend the Tolino newsletter it is in German mm -hmm. or their blog you can subscribe to the blog, but it also, it's not just about Tolino. It's a lot about writing, marketing, publishing in German. And so even if you're in KU, I would still recommending the Tolino blog mm -hmm. because there's tons of interesting information on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. good. Awesome. So I think we must be nearing the end of our session here, but yeah. I um <laughs> I just wanted to say, is there like, like what, any last words of advice or any, any piece of, information or anything that you could if someone's about to start dipping their toes in German translations where would you what would you say to them um remember that you're basically starting off as a new author again mm. um and remember or like try to find out all the things that worked for you in English um all the things you did in the beginning that work like building a street team or like building those that core group of readers finding them um all the things you did back then, now you have to do them again, but don't think you know everything because you don't. Mm -hmm. It is like starting again with more knowledge. Uh, do your research, always do your research. Um, and do like interact with other authors. There's more and more of us who have translations and we are doing, starting to do like newsletter swaps and book funnel promos and things like that. Uh, there is like a version of the Zoe Bob promotion that some of you might know where it's like all of us have a book free on a particular day and send out a newsletter it's a lot smaller of course because we there aren't as many of us but there's a lot more opportunities now so do like if you have translations join those kind of groups on yeah. facebook and um, interact and cross promote and it's, don't be scared it's quite tough marketing isn't it <laughs> when you it don't is. speak the it language is. yeah it is definitely and i'm doing it in french has helped me because I speak German, so sometimes, as much as I try to imagine how it would be without speaking a word of the language, doing it in French, and then I did some other languages for my children's books, and so I, I know what it feels like, which, mm. um, but yeah, it helps to to have those readers who speak the language, and mm. so do ask and find those readers who are happy to help in return for some swag or some signed books. Readers are easy to please most of the time with some mm. things, and like... Yeah, and, and go to your yeah. Facebook group because there's lots and lots of information. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Go to the Facebook group. Buy my yeah. book. Of course, it's a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, definitely. And, and so, if someone's wanting to find you or your books or your either your fiction or your nonfiction, where's the best place to go? Uh, well, for my Sky McKinnon stuff, just skymckinnon.com, and I'm all on all the social media stuff. Yeah. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one consultations instead of I decided for that rather than doing things like courses and more non-fiction books because I love just talking to people one-on-one -on -one. Mm. I just it's so much more fun to to look at someone's books and mm. then recommend based on that rather than something just generic yeah. so if you go to peritonpress.com that's my where I have my consultations and all my non-author like non-reader focused stuff um okay. and yeah but exactly. I'm on all the social media and all the places and spend way too much time there. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, my my brain is yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good. That's you. that's been really, really good. And I'm sure all of our listeners will have appreciated everything, all the information you've given us here. That's yeah. been really, really cool. Yeah, so thank you so good. much. Um it's and lovely to talk to you. Yeah. So where can we be found? Shana? So we can be found uh, at spygirlspodcast.com where we've got all our previous 380 odd plus 90 plus episodes are on there as well. And of course, you find us on your favorite podcast app. And thank you to all those that are leaving reviews. We really, really appreciate it. And even if it's just a star rating, hopefully a good one, it helps us get up there in the charts. And we're on YouTube and Patreon at Spar Girls Podcast. Awesome. Thank you for that. And thank you again, Sky. We've loved having you on the show. And thank you all for joining us, um, ever, all the listeners out there in listener land. Um, that's it for now. We'll see you again next week. And thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Bye.